you guys know me, right? I'm uh, overly critical. I kind of consider that to be my job. You know, when you're on Amazon and you're judging a product, you never read the one-star reviews. Those guys are just dripping with some unreasonable uh, emotions and uh, they're not gonna say anything that's useful. But those two-star reviews, where somebody hated the product enough to leave only two stars, but they clearly were emotionally balanced enough to be like, hey, it's not one star, it's better than that, right? Like, I'm basically trying to make a channel that's a two-star review of everything. I'm trying to give you all of the negative aspects of a product so that you can really know what it's gonna be. Because if, if I give you all the negatives, then you know that everything else is positive. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to make the tech better. I'm trying to make the world a better place, even if it's just by improving the tech in 3D printers. So uh, I got this BQ H2 extruder in the mail. I ordered two of these after seeing my friend's review video over on the 3D Print General's um, YouTube channel. And I opened the box last night and started to really analyze this thing, doing my two-star review on it. And I can't find anything to say. You guys, I can't find anything negative to critique about this extruder. It's kind of heavy. That's it. But it's lighter than a normal full-size NEMA 17 stepper motor would be. So somehow we could bring the weight down. And that's about the only thing I can think of. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, last night when I was looking at this first, you know, first impressions, I was thinking this is game over. There's never going to be a better hot end extruder combination than this. Um, it looks a little bit, it looks a lot like the Hemera, but it's better in every way than the Hemera. So, and it's not even a clone. There's nothing cloned about this hot end. Sure, it's extremely closely derivative of Western products, but everything has been improved upon, which is the spirit of open source that we embody with um, what, is, what am I going to call it? The um, consumer level 3D printers that we all play with. So they've nailed it. This Chinese company, BQ, has absolutely, absolutely nailed it. I don't think I've ever been so impressed with a 3D printer component as I am with this. So let's take it apart and I'll show you how every single piece of this is just incredible. Speaking of weight, this whole thing, the whole assembly weighs 19.7 grams. A normal sized stepper motor for 3D printers here, this is like a full size stepper motor, weighs uh, 28.2 grams. You start to get a little bit smaller than that here. Uh, this is what you typically would see like when you have dual Z lead screws and you don't need as much power. 21.7 grams, okay. This getting smaller still, just depending on how much torque whichever application it is, is needed. And that one pretty much matches the entire weight of this whole hot end. So what we would typically expect to see as a uh, pancake stepper motor for lightweight applications up until now, 12.8 grams. So that is significantly lighter than the whole apparatus here. But let's take off just this little mini stepper motor and see how much it weighs. Yeah, so this is basically a pancake stepper motor itself, except that in these dimensions, it's clearly quite a bit smaller and it weighs 9.1 grams, so 10 grams lighter. Now, I'd love to see them use titanium or aluminum or something even lighter weight, maybe drill holes in this, any material that's not needed, um, you know, because stepper motors are quite heavy, but part of that, you can't do anything about it because uh, magnets are heavy, you know, that's just the way it goes. And when you're preferencing magnetic qualities of metal, you absolutely cannot be finicky and picky about the weight of the thing. So that's how that goes. We do need the strength, the torque, so it's a, it's a trade-off. Lighter weight means less torque. Anyway, that is incredibly impressive as far as the size and the weight. To talk about the rest of these components, let's get a closer look. This lens is crazy. You can see the teeth here are in focus and the hob gear is out of focus. So it's got a very shallow uh, depth of focus, depth of field. And the teeth here, speaking of those, are 
steel. Look at the magnet sticks to them. Yeah, so all of the gears in the assembly, this one, this one, and this one, are all made by machining steel. And not only that, the, um, you can see the machining lines. You see those shining off of there? So there's concentric machining lines. And if I scratch it, you can hear what's going on there. That means that this was machined. It was lathed. This is not metal injection molding, you guys. This is high quality machined teeth, which means that you're gonna get much better engagement with these teeth in the other teeth. You're gonna get better, um, what's the term? Meshing, synchronizing of the gears there, um, which is just phenomenal. What a great attention to detail. The, um, the gears smell kind of like bicycle lubricant, so I don't know what they've actually used to lubricate it, but it's a very light oil, so it's not too messy. And if we look at this hob gear, it is not a knockoff of the Bond Tech. That is gonna be uh, very similar, same idea, but you know what? That is not Bond Tech's unique idea. Bond Tech just had a great implementation of a dual hob gear. Time out. I was just editing this video and decided to double check myself and see if I was right about this not being a cloned uh, hob gear assembly, the, the, the dual driven hob gears. So here on the Bond Tech website, we can see these smaller uh, dual driven gears. These are the ones that I'm used to seeing. I had not ever seen the larger size there in the background. We're seeing that larger size. And so it does appear that the, uh, the dual hob gears on this, um, BQ are cloned from the Bond Tech design, which is, that's bad. Cloning is bad form. But uh, there's a problem with that as I see it, and that is the fact that once you uh, clue in on dual hob gears as the thing to do, um, and you start simplifying and, and value engineering it, this is the answer that everybody's gonna come to. There's, uh, I think that the, the leap here, you know, the. The, the, the intellectual property is just the idea of driving it with two gears, driving filament through with two, with two hob gears. So huh, in this instance, it's a bit more of a gray area than other clones. So I don't like clones. They are bad for the hobby. They are bad, you guys, but uh, you know, whatever. It is what it is. Here in this assembly, we can see the other side, uh, the other corresponding hob gear, the, the pair, the twin. And you would expect this arm right here to be made out of plastic, wouldn't you? But it's metal. Everything on this hot end is metal. It's amazing. And all of the pivot points are bearings. The only bushing on the whole apparatus is the pivot point for the lever arm. All of the metal that doesn't need to be like durable, we're talking about the steel gears here, all of this is made out of aluminum, which has been anodized black. So if I give this a scratch here, we'll see the uh, the shiny aluminum underneath. This hot end here is kind of a unique shape, and it's also an aluminum block with your typical brass nozzle. Um, a little bit of a large hole there. I guess they're expecting you to use a cartridge style thermistor. This looks to be a standard nozzle throat um, size. So I should be able to get the slice engineering throat, the fancy one with the bonded copper and stainless steel, and I should be able to throw that onto this assembly, which would be really cool. There is one potential Achilles heel of this um, hot end, and that is the fact that this little motor doesn't have a lot of torque, and so it's going to get geared down quite a bit. I think it might be a 27 to 1. Here, I'll put the correct ratio on the screen. So that gear ratio is going to mean that this motor is going to be spinning really quickly, and we all know that stepper motors do not do well with high RPMs. So there's a potential for problems with that. I don't see this as a high flow solution, but it's pretty fantastic for the way that most of us use 3D printers. Okay, I think I found one, a legitimate gripe. The gears, despite being machined steel, are not perfect. And as I spin this, uh, I get to sort of tight moments. There's a, it's spinning pretty freely right through there. And then, uh, you know, it's spinning okay right now. So it comes and it goes. And granted, I don't have this side of the, um, of the shaft of the axle secured at the moment, but when I put the whole thing together and try to drive it by the large gear here, um, I still have problems. So even with the axles fully seated, the gears can have tight spots. Anyway, to try to alleviate this problem, I'm gonna use this gear butter 
a friend of the channel, Michael Hathaway, he's actually the executive producer of this video, and he's uh, he sells this stuff, so yeah, look him up. I think it'll work well in this application, which is metal to metal. He also sells this tink seal stuff, which is really cool. It's got these nanoparticles in it, maybe graphite. I don't know, he won't tell me what's in there, but uh, this is meant to be a plastic to metal um, lubricant because the grease eventually like dries away and it leaves just the nanoparticles, just the like graphite or whatever it is, the phenomenal high tech stuff. And so you have a micro lubricant that's like a dry lubricant after the, the grease kind of dries away and it doesn't damage your plastic. So yeah, pretty high speed stuff there. But uh, that's the wrong stuff for the application. We're going to use the gear butter. Actually, that gear butter has made a huge difference. I was not expecting that. So wow, props, Michael. Um, now it might just be that the lubricant that came on this was really poor or pretty much non-existent. So any lubricant might have helped, but dang, that's so much better. All right, I've got the thing back together, but I can't drive it by spinning this wheel. It's all it's all seized up, and I could before I took it apart just now. So what I did is I rotated the um, plug here. It was at the bottom, and I rotated it up to the top. So I think I need to align the stepper motor in such a way that it's um, sort of pushed away from the other gears. I think it's too tight, too close to the gears, and it's binding everything up. Well, I'm actually really struggling to get this thing put back together. So currently I just have these two gears um, going into the, the housing here and uh, it's still pretty difficult to turn. There are moments like right there where it's really tight, quite tight, and then it's loose across there and then it's real tight again. So uh, they did a good job. These are machined gears, which typically is what you want for accuracy because metal injection molded MIM gears are not as precise, but uh, this is bad, you guys. This is, this much friction in the gear train is gonna mean that this little tiny stepper motor is not gonna be up to the task. It's not gonna be able to push. It's gonna be using up all of its torque just to get the gear train to turn over, let alone uh, you know, torque actually being used to push the filament through the hot end. Okay, well after about an hour worth of tinkering, I finally got it to this position here. And what I had to do <laughs> in order to get here was quite involved, so let me tell you guys. First I've got this little condiment container and I filled it up with paint thinner and I was able to sort of shake it around with the gears inside of it to clean all of the, um, you know, schmoo, all the dirt and debris off the off the gears because you know they played that nasty old Chinese trick on me where they send you a product without actually cleaning the gears uh, after cutting them and grinding them so uh, you have all that grinding dust left on the gears they're not cleaned well enough and um, that didn't solve the problem so I had to dig into it even more deeply. What I did is I started spinning it by hand just like this until I can feel like there's a tight moment right there and I used the Sharpie to um, sort of blacken the gear. And then I would take a sharp pointed needle file and score right there at the tight spot. So now I can take it apart and I can see that scored line. And what I can do is opposite the scored line over here on the shaft, I can take the needle file and sort of grind down the shaft. And about an hour of this, Constant measurement, re-blackening, mark, mark where it's tightest, and don't forget to do the other side of the shaft. That's how I was able to size that shaft down, and actually what I'm doing is I'm centering the shaft because the gear is eccentric. There's a slight bit of wobble to it. The passive or driven side of the um, dual feeding hob gear mechanism with the arm is a little bit problematic because that axle is a press fit in there and without drilling a hole here and pressing back from the top I have no way to get it out to inspect it. It does feel like there's a bearing inside of there and that's about the right height for one of those needle bearings that we've seen uh, previously on the like Bontech knockoff versions but those gears have not been beveled really. Well I guess there's a slight bevel to them. So hopefully um, we're not going to get this condition where the gears grind into the aluminum carrier. Only time will tell. Well, that was a lot of work, but it was absolutely worth it. That is smooth as butter the whole way through now. There's no tight spot 
whatsoever. So that is ready to be installed onto the printer. So I opened up the box here to get the fan that goes on the end and yeah, there was a lot of other stuff included. A really high quality heater cartridge and the thermistor cartridge. That silicone boot is able to clip around and hold on to that hot end better than any of the other silicone boots I've ever used. Also included in the box are some Allen keys, this um, fan cover that I'm not going to use because I'm trying to save weight, and a rubber ducky. <laughs> Don't know what that's for. Want to see something in front of you guys? This other one is perfectly smooth through all of its travel straight out of the box. So all that work that I had to do on this one, not necessary on the other one. So they just have quality control consistency issues there at the factory. Actually, you guys, this is a slightly different design. So what I might have here is two different iterations, and this might be the old iteration, and this newer one is when they've got everything figured out. You see on this one, if I undo these two bolts, instead of just this uh, front half with the um, lever arm popping off, it actually allows me to spin the stepper motor and orient the, um, the plug upward. So those bolts go all the way through, whereas on this one, those bolts just go this far, and then uh, there's a separate set of bolts connecting the stepper motor to the, um, the actual hot end slash extruder assembly. Well, this hot end is gonna go on what's left of my Two Trees Sapphire printer. I have heavily modified this thing, and unfortunately, you can't even buy this model. This was the first one they put out, and it was the superior model because it has these um, stepper motors for the X and Y axis, underneath the floor, which isolates them from a heated chamber. I'm gonna build this thing into a heated chamber. And these rods come all the way up here and they control the belt. So everything on this printer is made out of metal except for the belts, that's it. And this entire hot end extruder assembly also made out of metal. No plastic on this thing except for the fan here and the, uh, the silicone sock. So this is gonna mount right under there eventually. I have to cut the tang off of the side of this and I have to do a bunch of work to the printer uh, in order to get it switched up. But this printer, I do have a massive upgrade. This is gonna be the best printer that I've ever made here um, when I can get to this project. Unfortunately, I have to put this on the back burner. There's other priorities. I don't have the five days to spend on this printer that it's probably gonna take me uh, to get it where I want it. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean we can't test this. So we're gonna plug this into the control board there and just see how fast we can push filament through it. All right, this whole hot end is set up in firmware now. The steps per millimeter have been changed so that it will feed through exactly 100 millimeters when I tell it to. And the thermistor values as well have changed so that um, that is accurately reading 220 degrees for the hot end temperature for extruding some PLA here. This black mark that you can see on the filament is 100 millimeters. So right there, the near edge, the close edge to the to the extruder and what we're going to do is go right to the top 60 millimeters per second see if this thing can handle it without skipping steps nope that seems to have missed a lot of steps that's nowhere near correct well that's not surprising this isn't something i've paid extra close attention to but i know that i skip many of my other uh, extruders at that fast of a feed rate. I don't even think that most of my extruders can handle 30 millimeters per second. So let's try 15 millimeters per second and see if this works. Got a new black mark there. Yeah, I could definitely actually visually see it skipping and not able to keep up with feeding through. All right, G0E100F600, which means a feed rate of 10 millimeters per second. There's my black mark, let's see how it does. Nope, it can't handle 10 millimeters per second. Let's try the feed rate F400. Not quite, it skipped a step or two. Didn't quite make it. All right, F345, which equates to a, um, what is it? 5.75 millimeters per second feed rate. So let's see if it does this one.
Yeah, that one worked perfectly. All right, let's talk about it. I did the math, I'll flash that on screen. Basically, this thing can handle 175 millimeters per second print speed when you're printing with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle at 0.2 millimeter layer heights. And that is much faster than most of us ever print. I have my fast Delta printers and they can handle speeds up to like 300 millimeters per second, but it's all about the acceleration and um, you do have flow characteristics uh, about the, 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 you know, the, the filament coming out of the nozzle. It, 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 things don't cool right, they don't lay down right. It, it, there is, I think that the sort of limiting factor on FDM 3D printing is the flow of the filament out of the nozzle. So I'm finding personal experience at the moment, and this isn't like my life. I don't spend my life trying to tune printers and get them to you know, squeeze out filament as fast as possible. It's kind of a thing that I dabble in. So don't take this as gospel, but at the moment I'm finding that 100 millimeters per second is kind of the upper limit on uh, print speed for, for that balance of quality with print speed. Um, and after that, it's really all about acceleration and jerk settings, which is you know, completely dependent on the inertial mass of your printer. So all of that is to say that there's kind of a speed limit, kind of a speed limit on FDM 3D printing of around 100 millimeters per second in my experience. So with this thing able to go 175 millimeters per second with a normal nozzle, uh, it's well and truly an option. There's, it's not gonna be the limiting factor. The small stepper motor is everything you need it to be. And in fact, that's a nice margin of safety, margin of error there, as the engineers would normally do. You, you take your, uh, your failure and you divide that by two, and that's the rating. So if something fails at 1,000 pounds, you rate it for 500 pounds of load. Uh, so that's almost double the 100 millimeters per second. So I think we're good. Now, there's all kinds of other considerations in um, print speed. First of all, you have uh, how sticky is your filament. I'm thinking PETG is a bit more sticky than PLA. So maybe there's more resistance. I don't know the viscosity of it. I don't know what the flow behavior of it, uh, you know, at the higher speeds or anything like that. So there's so many things to test. How, how fast can you squeeze the different filaments through this? What happens if you put a bigger nozzle in there? Well, surprisingly, a larger orifice increases the pressure. This is Bernoulli's principle. So it's gonna create more resistance to have a larger nozzle. You would think that it would be the opposite. You got a bigger hole to squeeze stuff through, but it, it kind of comes out the other way. So um, you're likely to get more back pressure uh, on the, um, the larger orifice, like a 0.8 millimeter nozzle, something like that, which could cause the stepper to skip. So if you get, go with a 0.6 millimeter nozzle, because of the, the, the way that the because of the way that the math all works out, the 0.6 millimeter nozzle might actually cause this stepper motor to skip at, I don't know, uh, 80 millimeters per second. So maybe half as, as quick as it can go right now. That's a guess, I'm just guessing there. <laughs> Pulling numbers out of my butt. I didn't crunch those numbers. So yeah, there's all kinds of considerations, but the bottom line is this all metal, super compact hot end works. It just works. It gets, it, it works at the right speeds and it's lightweight and I love it. I absolutely love it. This is totally the future. And the reason I love this, I think I already mentioned, it's because it's all metal. So I can stick it on that printer and put that printer in a heated enclosure and I don't have to worry about the thing melting or, or things going wrong at high heat. But you pay a price for that metal. Um, you do, you pay a price for that metal. So wouldn't it be nice to have a plastic version of this? Well, it's amazing. I think we're living in this golden moment here. We're finally seeing some more innovation in hot ends. And um, thank you to the Lightspeed. He's a, a viewer of this channel. And in one of my live broadcasts, he pointed out that Printed Solid is selling a hot end kind of similar to this, only instead of the um, involute gears, it has a, um, a planetary gear set in it. And I guess planetary gears that's have involute gears too. But anyway, different, slightly different kind of geared mechanism. And it's all plastic, which means it's gonna be a whole lot lighter weight. Unfortunately, printed solid is fall, uh, sold out of that uh, hot end, but I found it on AliExpress. So I've got some of those on order as well. And if they do everything that this one does, but they're half the weight, I'm gonna be sticking those direct drive um, extruder 
uh, hot end assemblies onto my Delta printers because we all know that you get better print results from direct drive. But <laughs> again, there's a huge caveat there. Um, this whole, what does Marlin call it? Um, uh, well, it's, it's um, linear advance. I think that's what Marlin calls it, linear advance. And in RepRap firmware, it's called pressure advance. And RepRap firmware, uh, those are the guys, Duet, they're the guys who originally developed that functionality. And it's awesome. It basically predicts the, um, the spool up, the, the sort of like rubber band or spring effect that you get by trying to feed filament through a Bowden tube. So you can compensate for the, um, the thing that a Bowden tube fails at. That's a, that springiness in the system. You can compensate for that with software, but it's always best to solve the problem at the root, at the base level, which means direct drive extruders. So I really do think that this is just gonna guarantee uh, really high quality prints um, without so much work in firmware and all of that. Um, that's not to say that Bowden tubes are dead or anything like that, but it's just, it's really awesome to see smaller, lighter weight, yet fully capable direct drive assemblies uh, coming onto the market. I'm really excited for this. Um, but we saw, you know, all, all of my initial excitement tempered a little bit because of those gears kind of, you know, that I had to rework and, um, you know, there is a, a, a top speed that you can print at, but no, it, it really does fulfill its promise. This is awesome. I cannot wait to start to see this component on 3D printers as we buy them. So we don't have to, it's not just, you know, the expert level, uh, you know, hacker who really wants to modify their 3D printers that can start to use this functionality. I would love to see this uh, coming stock on printers. All right, that's where we're gonna leave it. A big thank you to my Patreon supporters. That's these guys. Uh, without them, I would not have a channel. You, go, you guys would not be watching this video. That's the absolute truth. So these guys are awesome and they keep this channel going. Thank you so much. That'll do it for this one. Thanks for watching. See you next time.